Hello, my name is David Roth. I'm the founder of Illuminum and I also built the carbon checker extension for Solibri. And this is what this video is going to be about. We are going to take a look at the extension, how it works, what the user must do and think about when they do carbon calculations using Solibri and what comes out of that plugin as a result. Let's start with my open Solibri instance. Um, as you can see, I have no models opened and um, the first thing the user must do is to set up a role. And as you can see, there are four roles to choose from at the moment. Before we go forward, it is important to mention that we have within this project merged the emission factors, generic emission factors from the Finnish uh, Institute called Sike and Buverket. They have their respective um, climate databases. Uh, at the moment, the carbon checker extension runs on this version of Buverket's uh, climate database and we have the Rakentalisen data for the above ground construction uh, versions. So this is the data that's part of the carbon checker extension on board it and you choose what you want to work with either the Finnish data or the Swedish data uh, either in English or Finnish or respectively English and Swedish uh, for each data set and this is why there are four roles to choose from. Now let me choose for example the Finnish CK above ground construction data set and I will work with um, the English descriptions. So once I've opened the role, um, a bunch of classifications and information takeoff definitions are being preloaded and this is what I want. Now let's go back to recent where you know we can see pre-installed uh, IFC files and I will try to apply the carbon checker extension on the um, traditional Solibri building. The first thing you want to do is to go through the contents of the carbon checker classifications. There are three manual steps the user must do. Even though the list looks pretty long, um, most of the classifications have some kind of domino effect toppling on top of what the user has done manually before. So there are three manual steps that must take place in this order. First, we must work with the included components classification. Second, we work with the material mapping classification. Now note, here, depending on what language and what role you have chosen on the step before, you might either see material mapping in Finnish, Swedish or English. But it doesn't matter what you have chosen, the step is the same. So material mapping comes as the second step. The third step is to work with cavity ratio. I will explain everything. Let's start with included components. In a case where we have an entirely new building, which is built, let's say, on a field, the whole building is new and thus a subject to carbon calculation. However, most projects will be some kind of refurbishment, reconstruction or um, expansion of the existing construction. And this is why in this classification included components, we want to tell the model what is new and what is existing. We want to work with carbon calculations only on the new objects, not on the existing one. And without any further ado, let me, for example, define a case. So let's assume that the, um, just for the sake of the example, the first and second floor were existing. And in my construction, only the third floor and the roof have been added extra. And this will be different from, from project to project. So here the user really must think what is new and uh, what parameters and metadata do I use to tell the classification what is new and what is not. A tip, in Sweden we have this um, convention called BIP, 
there is a parameter called status construction. Hopefully the designers have communicated what is new and what isn't there. All right, floor one and two excluded, ground floor, first floor excluded, and the rest is included in the calculation. So when I click OK, the model will be mapped like this. And I can double check that and see the category for category separately. These objects are included in carbon calculation. These are excluded from carbon calculation. So that's the first step and it is mandatory and the user must think about that. Unless you have new construction completely, then you're sort of safe, then everything is included. All right, step one, check. Let's take a look at the second step, and that's material mapping. Now, if I go back to um, these databases, they have their own names for materials. And these names are preloaded in the material mapping list here. If you have the Finnish version, the Finnish material mapping, you will see Finnish names. If you see, if you have chosen the Swedish material mapping with Swedish descriptions, then you will see Swedish names. But the principle is the same, that the material names uh, are preloaded. The Finnish database on top of materials and products contains also scenarios and work processes. These are excluded at the moment from carbon checker extension because we want to work here with embedded carbon in the building components at first hand. And here comes the trickiest, the most human error prone stage of this whole work. Why? The experience of the BIM coordinator at this stage matters. The whole business case of Solibri and BIM coordinators as such uh, stems from the fact that AEC designs are not correct. They're not being designed correctly. They have overlapping geometries. They have wrong metadata. There is all kinds of uh, faults present in the models during the AEC design process. And we must put the glasses with very critical lens at the model. In theory, we could take a look at the list of metadata about materials and product names uh, in the model and then map them. But in practice, and from my own personal experience, I can guarantee you that at least 15% of metadata that is present in the model that is telling you what the component is made of is wrong. And that's a big problem. We will also go through a couple of tips later on in this video to help you improve the chance you will not simply buy the information you're receiving and validate um, later on so that you can pick and choose the right emission factor. Let's say I have not seen this model ever uh, before. I start by clicking randomly at a few components and looking at the info view and looking at the metadata about the object. Here, the work can take one hour if the model is built well, and it can take a few days to do a material mapping if it's built poorly. But here we have to basically take a look at the present property sets, present properties, and then make the best out of the uh, given information. I will do some material mapping really quickly so that we move on. Good. Now I have done the material mapping using the material mapping classification. And in my example here, I have just, you know, taken a look at walls, slabs and windows. But the purpose of this step is really to map everything that is actually part of the included components uh, 
classification class included in calculations because every object must have some emission factor assigned to it so here basically at the moment i have this class automatically popping up called unclassified which suggests to me that i have not yet classified these objects uh, but i will not do it at the at the moment as part of this example we will just take a look at how the principle works but the purpose of this step really is to make this unclassified class disappear because that will tell you that all objects have been uh, mapped to the uh, respective emission factors somehow all right let's take a look at what i have mapped i have mapped uh, some external walls uh, some internal walls and from the architect i know that we are going to build this building from sewn timber hence i selected sewn timber material name and i know that we are going to use some fiberboard for internal walls again from the architect and again the communication here with the designers it's, it's important because you cannot uh, always buy the information that you're getting uh, in the model as part of the metadata uh, sometimes it will be missing sometimes it will be wrong and sometimes it will be poorly described so here again the dialogue of the BIM coordinator doing this very step uh, with the designers is crucial but let's say I know this then I can assign these emissions uh, factors correctly. Yes. Um, what happens when I click OK? A whole set of domino effects will occur. Pay attention to all these classifications which have locked uh, in brackets as part of the name. All these locked classifications will get populated with data as as a result of the material mapping step what do we have there let's take a look we have the identification numbers the resource IDs for the given materials from the original databases since I work with the finished database it will be the co2 data.fe database we have here also a material category system uh, let's say uh, the overarching group of materials like metals automatically assigned as a result of the material mapping step what do we have there next the local name and the english name so automatically uh, the english name will be fetched since i work in english it's sort of a duplicate but let's say i would be working it with the swedish descriptions then it's actually nice to see the english names as well for the international colleagues then we have the emissions factor so the emissions factors are assigned respectively to the material groups and here i would like to give you a warning because some emission factors are communicated per unit or per meter per meter squared or per meter cubed and you don't have to worry about that much it's just that sometimes I've seen that people like to look at these numbers just to communicate carbon intensity, but that you can do only when you have the conversions unit uh, the same uh, for the respective numbers. And you can see which conversions unit uh, uh, has been assigned to each of the emission factors by pressing on the classes here. But just to give you the example, the full list of the conversions unit, again, per unit, per meter, per meter squared, per meter cubed. And since the conversions unit uh, for these uh, resources uh, happens to be in kilograms per meter cubed, then these are actually uh, comparable. And we can say that uh, this material is much more carbon intensive uh, then this material and then this material and so on so um, these are the uh, emission factors and last but not least are conversion values now since we are working at the moment with those um, resources which have conversions unit per meter cubed then 
the conversions values would be reflecting the density of the materials. And the good news is that the user doesn't have to worry about that. Once material mapping is done, and hopefully it's done properly, and you click OK, all of these locked classifications will get populated automatically. Let's take a look at this uh, component, for example, at this window, which I have uh, classified. So if we take a look at the BIM data tab and classification, all of these, all of this data coming from these classifications uh, follows with the object as a result of that. This step with the material mapping is the most human error prone step of the whole work process. Because if you do not have the right dialogue or if you trust the models blindly, you might get this wrong. Once you have done the mapping with the information from the model, you want to confront the creator of the model and hear from them if the material mapping classes you have now created are actually uh, correct and if they agree to what they see. Now, in an ideal world, we would have emission factors for all of the objects, for all of the materials and products that we are building with. But especially in the case of the generic emission factors, that's not the case. So we have to find the closest to uh, our products. And it will take some experience to build that. Uh, luckily, these databases have very good descriptions about uh, when is that material used for what purpose. Now let's assume that we have found the perfect material, the perfect emission factor from these two databases, and we want to use it. But we also know that we are in an early stage of the design and the architect has not had the time to model everything correctly. And let's say we know that, that this, this slab is actually hollow. There's some weird structural feature in it and, you know, half of this volume is air. This problem is very peculiar when we are working with, for example, pipes, ducts, these are hollow objects, but also with furniture, because, you know, we usually model just the volume, but 90% or more of that volume is air because it's cupboards and there's, you know, uh, they're supposed to take in stuff. So they're definitely not solid. So for the, all of the non-solid uh, objects, we have also introduced the option for you to specify the cavity ratio. And that's this third step. Cavity ratio basically allows you to specify what share of the volume is going to be just air or vacuum. Either, um, i.e. it will not be solid, i.e. Uh, should be nuanced. Now, how hollow they are, again, that you must gain from the architect because it's most likely not going to be part of the model. But let's say the architect tells you that roughly, you know, the half of the volume, uh, of the brutal volume of the slab is cavity. So you type in 0.5. The cavity ratio is a value, is a decimal value, including zero and one, and you can have anything in that range. When cavity ratio is zero, the object is solid completely. When cavity ratio is one, the object is virtual, like a space or an opening. For example, for pipes and ducts, cavity ratio is roughly uh, at 98, 99%, which would then translate as cavity ratio 0 0.99 or 0 0.98. And this is something you will have to calculate or estimate but this will help you to get more precise carbon calculations when we are in early stage of a design. 
All right, let's press OK. Now we go to the calculations themselves. So we leave classifications and take a look at the information take of view instead. As part of the role selected, automatically these ITO definitions follow. And, you know, it's no big deal. You just press take of all ITOs and all of these uh, ITOs will be calculated. And let's take a look at what we have there. These two ITOs, ITO per GUID and ITO grouped, give you a more nuanced sort of the full bill of quantities with all the data there is and all the common metadata there is together with the classifications, together with some volumes, areas, lengths, etc. but also the bounding boxes in case we are assuming a very geometrically poorly modeled model. The difference in between the ITO per GUID and ITO grouped is that the one that is grouped, um, where, where whenever there are objects which have exactly the same geometries and metadata, they will be grouped and you will get the sums in terms of volume and areas, etc. However, here we are forcing that each individual BIM object, maybe a tiny screw or a big wall, uh, has its own separate row. And thus the volumes, areas, lengths, and uh, all the metadata is specific to that BIM object. Now you have uh, an eye that pays attention. You might have noticed this column, GWP, global warming potential is being calculated automatically for you from all the data that follows with the classifications and the respective quantities. So here, since I am on the ITO per GUID, I can see what's the carbon footprint of this particular window. And here I can see what is that thing? That's a wall. The carbon footprint of this particular uh, wall object. And here I can see again, carbon footprint of this particular window, depending on this particular area and volume. Let's go further. We have the global warming potential per component. Here we have a more grouped list, more condensed list. The GUIDs do not play a role. We have a limited amount of categories and, and we are grouping calculations, in this case per component, per discipline and per material. So these are sort of grouped carbon calculations. Um, pay attention to here. Um, we configured that the slab will be 50% hollow and the cavity ratio follows up here. For all the other objects which we have not specified any cavity and classified will be returned but that does not uh, sort of destroy the calculations. Uh, as you can see calculations are still being done once we do classifications of the material mapping. For all the objects which we have not done material mapping, i.e. these, which you know are still under the category unclassified, unclassified will be returned. So no, no calculations will be done if the material is not known and thus emission factor is not known. But if we assign the emission factors, if we assign cavity, it will follow with all the ITOs and give you the results correctly. The life cycle stages involved are A1 to A3. So th this number reflects only these life cycle stages. All right, so that's the one, that's the ITO per component. It's pretty obvious. Then we have per discipline where even components are removed and we just want to know what architectural uh, components are causing as much uh, carbon, what structural components are causing as much carbon and so on. And last but not least, 
is the uh, material based results and this is particularly important for those people who are doing procurement but I mean you can really quickly lab and, and, and swap yeah let's say from sewn timber and let's say I would go for uh, concrete here again and we take off this ITO um, we can see how the carbon footprint has gone up so this is how you can lab quickly last but not least there is the report button where you can take out this calculation to good old Excel and here we go this is all I hope carbon checker will prove very useful at your endeavors in optimizing the carbon footprint of your design and yeah good luck <laughs>